Welcome to Cut the Crop, keeping you in the know about everything you grow. Researchers, growers and other interesting folk delivering insights and information on topics ranging from agronomy to profitability. Brought to you by the Foundation for Arable Research. Hi, I'm Alison Stewart, the CEO of FAR. Welcome to this episode of Cut the Crop. And we're talking about finding your perfect match. Now, we've not suddenly decided to get into the online dating game. We're talking cereals. And so today we have Joe Drummond, who's FAR's cereals expert. And we're going to be talking about what are the um, key factors that you've got to think about when you're trying to select the base cultivar for use on your farm? Welcome, Joe. Thank you very much, Alison. It's great to talk about such an exciting subject. Yeah. Okay, so let's start off by just asking you, what are the key considerations that growers have to make when they're um, selecting a cultivar for the following year? This is quite a number of things that a farmer would need to take into consideration. And, and the first is, what's my system like? Where am I farming in New Zealand and how much wheat is around me? So if we're thinking about wheat, the main disease that we're trying to control using cultivar selection is septoria triticae blotch and it's a stubble-borne disease and it often depends on how much wheat you've got around you as to how much inoculum you've got floating around. How have I managed my stubble and importantly how has my neighbour managed their stubble? Because those ascospores, so that sexual phase of transmission is capable of travelling spores for quite a long way. It's not just how I manage it, it's how my neighbours have managed as well. And of course whether I'm irrigated or dry land. And the other thing to think about is when am I going to sow? It may not be appropriate to sow really early, it may be more appropriate to sow later, it depends on your soil conditions and where you sit in your rotation. There's a lot of things to consider. So the two key things then really are um, relative susceptibility to disease and sowing time. Absolutely. There's a number of other factors, but those are the two that really stick out as being the, the real key drivers for cultivar selection. So what is cultivar resistance from a technical point of view? So cultivar resistance is a really efficient way of, um, of having disease control without actually having to use any chemical. And it comes about um, back at the breeding stage, so plants that look like they have tolerance to certain diseases are bred up and then selected. And FAR does a, no a lot of work in this space looking at disease nurseries and part of cultivar performance trials and that gives us disease ratings that we can assign to the cultivars that give growers confidence that they're selecting a variety that's going to be tolerant or susceptible and they range from an S for susceptible to R for resistant and anything in between. So an example of a, of a cultivar that's quite resistant, when we run our cultivar performance trials we typically have an untreated replicate sitting alongside our, our normal trial program and what that does is it allows us to really test those ratings to see what the yield loss is going to be with fungicide and without. So if we think about a cultivar that's really susceptible, in a season where you might have quite high disease pressure you might have a five or six tonne yield loss and that shows us that that cultivar is really susceptible. On the other side of the coin if we've got a cultivar that's really resistant your yield loss might be only two tonnes and that is really significant in terms of the inputs but also in terms of the flexibility it gives us if we run into seasonal issues as we do, things like machinery breakdowns or bad weather. So it's a really important tool that we can utilise to help us make decisions. And I suppose um, you know different cultivars will have different levels of tolerance to a different range of diseases. And so the grower has to always be thinking about what are the particular disease problems that I'm likely to have in any one season and how much should I focus on um, cultivar resistance versus managing it through fungicide applications, particularly if the cultivar um, the resistant cultivar may not be as high a yielder. So there is quite a sort of matrix of, of decisions that the grower has to, has to sort of come up with. Absolutely, and I think in the past there has been this tendency for cultivars that had really strong disease resistant packages to be typically lower yield potential. And we see that with something like Empress, which has been in our CPT program for about nine years. It's a really nice looking cultivar. It's green as anything, it looks really pretty, but its yield potential 
doesn't match those of the newer varieties. But the good news is that breeding changes and developments are happening all the time. And we've got cultivars coming through such as Firelight, things like KWW78, Ignite. They've all been in our CPT program for three or four years and they are regularly topping up yield tables that also have uh, that inbuilt resistance. Another example is Graham. It's got a great yield potential and its disease package is somewhere in the middle of that range. So we don't need to necessarily compromise on our yield potential by now having a cultivar that requires fewer inputs or more flexibility. All it does is it just gives us options. So given the fact that, you know, sort of, I guess the consumer is wanting um, less pesticides put on um, cereal crops and a whole range of other food produce, do you think that cultivar resistance is going to become a much more important component of sort of the way in which growers manage their diseases? Absolutely. And one thing we talk about with growers is actually getting to use their crop as the barometer. So when it comes time for them to look and think about applying pesticides, they need to actually look in their crop and see what it is that's in there and whether or not they need to apply a pesticide. A really good example of that is the likes of a, um, a T0 or a growth stage 30 to 31 fungicide. If you've got a cultivar that really stacks up in terms of its disease tolerance and you walk that crop and have a really good look in it and it's green all the way down, you can instantly say, I don't need to go for that application, I can wait and save my money and apply it where it really needs it. And that's great from a resistance point of view, it's great from a save you money in your pocket point of view, but it also gives the consumer confidence that you are thinking about what you're putting on and the impact of what your applications are. So, you know, we've talked about time of sowing and we've talked about, um, you know, sort of selecting um, resistant cultivars that are appropriate. How do the two of those come together and then also sort of help the grower manage um, resistance problems, as in fungicide resistance or pesticide resistance problems in their crops? So with time of sowing, the earlier you sow, the more pressure you put on your system. The more pressure you put on the system, the harder that cultivar resistance has to work and the more fungicides you're going to need to control any infection. The later you sow it, it gives you more options. The thing with fungicide resist, or the thing with resistance, and particular for, particularly for Septoria triticide blotch, it's it's not a blanket. It's not the di the disease isn't the same. It's like the common cold or a flu. There's lots of different variants of that virus, and it's how quickly they adapt. And by managing our cultivars and by managing our inputs, we're able to try and stay ahead of the game. It's a really difficult thing to kind of manage and the more exposure we give the different isolates of the disease to different fungicides, the quicker we can overcome them. And a really good example of this is when we lost our strobilurins. So we lost them over, overnight effectively. It was a single site mutation and it lost a whole group of chemistry. What we've got now, we've got our DMI family of chemistry and what we're seeing is a gradual sensitivity shift. So we're seeing more fungicide required to do the same job. So the more you throw at it, the faster we're pushing ourselves down that pathway. And by using cultivar tolerance and being able to use that to tweak what we do with our cultivars, it means we can use our chemistry for longer and it also means that our cultivars are going to last a bit longer. So where do we get most of our cultivars from? Actually a lot of the germplasm I believe is British. Um, and they come through our breeding programs. But the things that grow really well in the UK don't always grow really well here. So there's a, a little bit of tweaking required. Um, it's a long game and we are looking at things all the time to try and improve what we can do. But I believe most of the germplasm is European. And so I guess, you know, the AHDB, our sort of equivalent in the UK, run their um, sort of cultivar evaluation trials. How well do the cultivars that we bring over from the UK that have been evaluated in their system, do, do the results translate to what we find in New Zealand? 
Yes and no. Um, and a really good example is Graham. Graham is a really common cultivar over in the UK and it grows really well here. Um, we've recently had um, a plant protection expert out from the AHDB who very kindly joined us on our honeymoon, Catherine Harries, and we were discussing some of the similarities between our programs. And it looks like we're marrying up reasonably well in terms of our, our decision making around cultivars. So we seem to be on the same page, but there's more work that we need to do to really understand the whole system a bit better. So what cultivars um, or what cultivar trait do you think is is a gap that we've got in New Zealand? Like if you could um, select, a, you know, a trait that a cultivar had, what would it be? Well, if I think about a perfect cultivar, a perfect cultivar... Like your perfect match. My perfect is, match. Is Graham it, close to your perfect match? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> um, so at the moment, a perfect cultivar needs to have a really good disease-tolerance package. It needs to have a really good stiff straw strengthness to be able to stand up, and it needs to have a reasonable length of maturity. That's what we need if we're going to sort of maximise our yields and profitability. And at the moment, you can pick any two of those. So out of the three key things, you can pick two of them. So yeah. I think it's up to you and your system which two traits you really, really fo want to focus in on. But getting a, a real good all-rounder, I think something in that good mid-range. So maybe something like Graham might well be my perfect match. But there are many other uh, less uh, interestingly named cultivars for you to choose from. <laughs> Okay, so any other take-home messages for the growers around cultivar selection? Okay, I think there are a number of things that we can talk about. So cultivar, cultivar resistance ratings, they give you flexibility. I think that's the real key take-home. It gives you some flexibility, and we haven't touched upon it, but if we get conditions like we have in this past season in some parts of the country where we have quite wet weather during key timings, we sort of end up inadvertently straddling our flag leaf, which is our most important spray. Sounds painful. It is quite painful, um, particularly painful to the wallet if you get it wrong. Um, having a, a resistant cultivar gives you greater flexibility. So if you find yourself in a position where you're not able to get your applications on when you need to, it hurts a bit less. Um, other things to consider, time of sowing, it's really great if you want to go early, but you have to be aware that if you're going to go early, you've got to put a lot more inputs on. It's not as kind on the wallet. And in terms of consumer preference, that's perhaps something we need to be thinking about in the future. But if we delay our sowing, it's not just disease that we're going to be thinking about, it's things like pests as well. So likes of BYD infection, BYDV infection, Later sowing date gives you a bit more flexibility in terms of aphid flights and it doesn't put as much pressure on your seed treatment and it means that maybe you can think about holding off on foliar insecticides if you're able to get your crop to a point where it's tolerant after the aphid numbers have dropped. Other things to consider in terms of time of sowing are things like making sure you've got weed control options. So later sowing, you're able to control those flushes of weeds a little bit better. So how site-specific are all of these decisions? I mean, it, can, can growers within a particular region um, sort of make the same dis, um, sort of decision on cultivars or does it really come down to the right cultivar for my farm? I'd like to think it was the right cultivar for my farm, but they're also governed by what's available and what the contracts are, whether they're growing for seed or whether they're growing for feed or whether they're growing a milling, milling wheat cultivar, so it depends on the demand at the other end. Um, farmers often have a reasonable idea of what they think they'd like to put in, and it's just making it fit within their rotations. So we know that um, you know in the industry there are quite a few growers now that are moving away from full cultivation and are exploring sort of strip tillage and direct tillage. Um, till. What impact do you think that change in management practice is going to have on the cultivars that they select? That's a really good question and I touched on it a little bit earlier uh, around the management of stubble. So if you're in a direct drilling space you're going to have your stubble in the paddock and if you are going to be drilling wheat uh, two paddocks away or half your farm away or if you have another lease block that's 15 kilometres away that has a bearing on how much of the primary inoculum is going to spread. So if you are in a position where you are uh, direct drilling or if you're min till or if your neighbours are in that position that's where you need to start looking at you know cultivars that have got good resistance packages or maybe delaying during, drilling a little bit but again it depends where you are regionally and what your soil type is because for some growers drilling in May is not really going to be an option because the soil gets far too wet but that's where something like that cultivar resistance can really help you. 
So from FAR's perspective, what are the key areas of research that we're focusing on in, that you think that will help growers dis decide on cultivars? We've done um, quite a large program on cultivar by fungicide program and what we're needing to do now is really understand the flexibility of the cultivars. So we've already quantified that having a cultivar gives you options, but let's see what happens if we get it slightly wrong. If we find ourselves in a straddle position, we need to quantify those things a bit more so it gives growers some confidence that what they're selecting is actually going to do the job for them. So we, you know, we have a lot of discussion out in the media and in the general public about climate change. I mean, clearly, if we um, recognise that there's going to be changing climate, you know, m more extreme conditions, drought or flooding, presumably we're going to have to start looking at cultivars that can bring some of those beneficial traits that will make the crop more resilient to, that, to the climate change. Are we starting to look at that in our um, sort of cultivar performance trials? With many of the cultivars that we have here coming from European germplasm, I think it's probably important for us to start thinking outside the box a little bit. Climate change is going to mean extremes of, of extreme events, so not just drought but also floods. So perhaps we need to start thinking um, maybe some of the cultivars that are suited to, um, to the high rainfall zone in Australia, bearing in mind the high rainfall zone in Australia typically gets about 500 mils of rain and they get it differently to us. Um, we need to maybe start thinking about cultivars that might be, have a really short season, similar to what they do in Australia. We need to just think outside the box and plan, plan ahead for things because I think we've been really lucky and that the cultivars we have got have really suited us, but we need to put our sort of 10, 15 year hats on and consider some other options just to make sure that we can keep growing in the way that we can. So how long does an, an established cultivar normally sort of last out in the marketplace? Oh, that's a, that's a toughie too. Um, some cultivars can last for quite a long time, but sometimes what we see is a breakdown in their tolerance, and we've seen that really clearly in a couple of cultivars, such as Starfire and Torch. So five years ago, a cultivar like Starfire had a really strong disease management package, and it was grown everywhere. And I mentioned before that Septoria is not a static beast, there's lots of different isolates and those isolates will adapt. Again, it's just like a cold or a flu, it'll adapt and it will go where a cultivar is susceptible. And over time, depending on what isolates are around, we start to see those, those ratings slip. So it's not, it's not just important for us to protect the chemistry we've got, it's important for us to, to protect the cultivars that we have. And so it is likely then that, you know, we're probably going to be having to change cultivars on a more regular basis than we've had in the past because climate change is going to create, you know, sort of much more variable environments. And then that will potentially impact on the severity of the diseases that we get as well. Absolutely. So things like septoria, which is a wet season disease, if we have a season that's really droughty, not a problem. If we have a season where we have high rainfall periods and lots of risk periods where we're getting humidity over 85% and accompanied with, with that leaf moisture, then it's gonna, going to become a really uh, like another issue. But of course the greatest fungicide we've got is dry weather. So if we find ourselves in a position where we are droughty, and we've developed a cultivar that has some drought tolerance to it, then we're in a position to be able to make some real headway in that space. So it's thinking ahead before we get to that position and we're hopefully moving in the right direction. Excellent. Thank you very much, um, Jo. Um, it's clearly not a s simple, straightforward sort of decision to make. There's lots of um, sort of complicated factors in there. Um, but yes, thank you for uh, giving us your insight today. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm sorry if I wasn't able to name a perfect match, but it's up to you to make the decision based on all of the factors that are important for your farm. Okay, so maybe Graham will just do in the meantime I think and, until somebody else comes along. <laughs> Great. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, listeners, um, and have a great day on the farm. Thanks for tuning in to Cut the Crop, presented to you by FAR. If you'd like to know more about any of the topics discussed or have any suggestions for future topics, go to www.cutthecrop.co.nz.